here at times it is freezing and at other times it is cooking. And we just have to be able to get it right. Well, surprise. This is what happened yesterday. The pump caught on fire. This could have been really bad. Fortunately, everything worked. It did. It shut. The breakers all shut down. It was only for a second. And we were doing plumbing until late last night. But that's an unexpected thing. Can God teach us with the unexpected? Can God sometimes use those things to say, hang on here. You think you know where things are going. We're going to go in a different direction. Because that's the story of Christmas. It's the story of Christmas. Next week, we're going to take a break from the series. We're going to have our annual concert. I'm going to tell you, this is always one of the hardest weeks of the year because we're trying to get the final details together of the Christmas concert. And you know what it's like when you have a lot of kids out here. It's like herding cats. I mean, it's always a little scary. It's always a little scary. Because part of it is we know the story so well, and we're trying to find new and creative ways to try to give it a fresh look and make us understand it. Ran across something this week of others who've tried to do the nativity stories. Uh, there is there is one person who wrote about the time that they had uh, Mary and Joseph wandering around the stage, knocking on doors, trying to find a place to stay. When all of a sudden, when the kids yell from the back, "You should have booked online." <laughs> <laughs> or the one kid who was really worried they had one line and the Virgin Mary was with the child and they practiced it and practiced it and when they finally got up on stage it didn't quite come out right because it came out and the Viking Mary was with the child Or the class that was just sitting around and the teacher was trying to make sure that they knew the story before they went on to stage. And said a little bit funny the question, which virgin was the mother of Jesus? One of the kids put up their hands and said it was the King James Virgin. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because we know these stories so well. This is... Stories that we know well in the most traditional time of year, in which we're trying to hear the traditions again, but it's a story about breaking traditions and destroying the expectations that people have. Are we willing to let God shake our world and not just the world in a big sense, but our world personally, so that he can do something remarkable, so he can do something new. Are we willing to let God do it? Those who went through the Christmas story, God did shake their worlds. And was it worth it? I'm going to tell you, pretty much everyone who's involved in the Christmas, not quite everybody, but pretty much, whose worlds get shaken, the response in the scriptures is to break out in song. They sing. That's why we're calling this the songs of expectation. There was a surprise. Luke chapter 1, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now we talked about Elizabeth last week. We talked about her husband, like right, two weeks ago. Husband was confronted by an angel saying that your world, your expectations are going to be shattered. Now, we think this is a good thing because his world is one of disappointment. He knows his life is disappointment. A lot of people, their expectations and the things that they adopt about themselves, the way that they think about their lives are negative for a lot of people. My life's a disappointment. The angel comes and says, we're going to break that expectation. He doesn't believe. Not a chance. God can't do that. His wife, however, does believe. She becomes pregnant at an old age. God destroyed the images that they held of themselves. It continues. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, 
a town in Galilee. Actually, a little tiny village. Gabriel, we've already run across in Luke chapter 1. He's one who is described as one who stands in the presence of God. Can one who stands in the presence of God come to a little town? Yeah. How about that? God come to a place like Viking? To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. This probably, if she's at this stage of life, Mary's probably a girl, 13, give or take a little bit. She has known what her life would look like from the moment she could understand speech. She is being told that she will marry at this age. She will very quickly get pregnant. She will give birth to as many kids as possible. She will uh, look after the family household. She will do this, she will do that. Whether she likes it or not, well, that was, she was never really given any choice. And probably she did because of, that's just how the kids were told. This is what life's all about. This is how your life is going to look. This is from day one to the very end. This is exactly how your life will play out. And it's going to play out like every other girl in small town Israel. Your life is going to be exactly like this. And she is playing the role that the world has given to her completely. She's gotten engaged at the age she should to the type of man she should get married to. The virgin's name was Mary, he should have guessed so. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now that's interesting, isn't it? The angel shows up and praises her, says good things about her, and she's troubled. She should be troubled. So when God shows up and God does great things, in the end it's going to work out well for us, but it might cause trouble in the short term. God works, and sometimes that should scare us just a little bit. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. It's a, Jesus is an English version of a Greek version of a Hebrew name. It gets passed through a couple of languages. Basically, it means God saves. It was a common name both then and now. Very common name, as a matter of fact. But it was a very important name that he had. That God saves. That is going to be the point of this child. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. It's poetic language. It indicates high royalty. Not just nobility, but it's coming to a peasant girl. Saying your child is going to be of the highest royalty. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Both Mary and Joseph were descendants of the great king David. Their family lines had diverged some 800 years before, but this is to be a child who is going to be known both physically because of his lineage, but also because of his position, a child of this, there's no better word than this legendary king. By legendary, I don't mean that he was not a true story, but a king who should be built up in the images and the minds of his people for nine centuries. Nine centuries they've been telling stories of David. And here comes the new David. Here comes one who will be like him. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. That's the great difference with David. David died. And I say Jesus died too. A little bit different. Because he rose from the dead and he is presently reigning at the right hand of his father in heaven. And he's coming back. Next we have a very good question. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. 
since I am a virgin. Here's the crux of the message. Her whole life laid out. She knew exactly how her life was going to play out. Everybody in the village knew exactly how her life was going to play out. Her whole life laid before her. She knew her role. She knew her place in the world. And now, God shows up and changes the plans. God shows up and changes the plans. You know, Mary was ready for this. 13, she shows a great bit of maturity as we go through this. Mary was ready. Right. you. God were to show up today, an angel were to show up and say to you, do you know what? Your entire life's about to be different. Everything that you know is about to change. How would you feel about that? Would you be okay? I gotta tell you, I probably would be like Mary and I would be a little afraid. In fact, I might be a little bit more like Zechariah the priest, the uncle, who said, uh, no, then, yeah, God, you're making a mistake. You can't really do this. i, I got to be honest. There, there'd be part of me very much that might say that. <coughs> or very much might want to say, no, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks, God, but I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, when we get many surprises in life, some of them good, some of them not so good. We have things that always appear in our life that may change everything. And I'm going to tell you something very important. All of them, all of them will do you good. Because God is at work. Even if God is the cause of the problems. Because he doesn't... You know, there's sin. There's things that go wrong in our world. But God can work all things together for the good of those who are. We get many surprises in life. Do you know what's remarkable? Mary's uncle, the priest, the big shot, he disbelieves when an angel shows up and gives him a message. Mary is puzzled. Merely puzzled. And when God is going to do great things, it tends to throw out what we are doing. It tends to throw out sometimes what we want. And our plans and expectations are changed by what God is doing. Verse 35. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. <clears throat> Clearly something amazing is happening. We don't know exactly how this works, but God's going to be the parent of this child. Mary is a vessel to bring the child of God into the world. And to give him proof, the angel says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Now granted, Elizabeth's miracle is a little bit less amazing. She's a little too old to have kids, but at least the ability is there. Her life has changed. Her expectations are shattered. She was going to be the disappointed one. Now she's the mother of this miracle child. Verse 37, for no word from God will ever fail. You know what? When we think we've got this world figured out, when we sit in absolute certainty about almost anything, we're going to discover a God who thinks very different than humanity. A God whose ways are above our own. Mary answers, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled to me. Bible is full of reverses, where things happen in the opposite, where the poor are rich and the rich are poor, 
where the sinners are justified, where the powerful come to fall. And the key is humility. James 1 verse 9 says, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. Do you know what? How do we prepare for God to be able to work in our life and to do something new, something exciting? To do it, we need to understand our place in this world and to see that God acts in different ways at different times. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. What on earth do we mean by that? Humility is a prominent grace of God. I looked up humility in the biblical dictionary. It came up with this high highfalutin type of definition. A prominent Christian grace, it is a state of mind well pleasing to God. It preserves the soul in tranquility. It makes us patient under trials. Christ has set us an example of humility. We should be led thereto to a remembrance of our sins and by the thought that it is the way to honor and that the greatest promises are made to the humble. It is the great paradox of Christianity that makes, the hum makes humility the avenue to glory. That's a great definition that really didn't actually answer the question. It's everything in its truth. Humility is what brings us to the glory of God. So what is it? And I think we can see it best, not through a definition, but through the words or through the actions of this young girl. The one who in English it says, I'm the Lord's servant. In actual, she says, I'm the Lord's slave girl. And it's where she comes and basically says this, I prefer obedience and the will of God to my own plans and expectations. See, pride is the opposite to that. Pride says my way is the best way. That's basically what pride is. My way is the best way. We have a mindset that even where I have a certain way of seeing the world, even where I have a certain way of thinking how the world should work, even where I have a way of seeing that I know how I fit into this world, God loves me so deeply that his plans are always preferable. His ways are always the better way. Humility is not as we sometimes think about thinking myself low down to the ground or something like that. Thinking, oh, I'm nothing. I'm no good. You know, that's not what humility is all about. Really, that's more like pride because it's thinking about myself. And thinking, well, my life took a different path. The path that I wish it would take my life would be better. That's what, that's what that falls into. Humility is thinking that God is so high and that I have faith in him so that I will abandon my preconceptions of my life, my situation, my family, my working situation, everything. And I do not assume I know how things are going to go, but rather I let go of the expectations I have. The plans I make, I realize I'm not in control. And you know what? It's better that I'm not. It is actually taking a very high position on myself. Because really, humility, to be humble, you really have to believe that God loves you. And God loves you very deeply. You have to have that in the deepest part of your hearts. That God is going to look after me no matter where this goes. No matter what happens. God loves me so much that he will work all things for the good of those who love him. This leads to Mary running away, basically. And God gives her great confidence by sending her to Elizabeth. 
Last week we looked at Elizabeth's reaction when Mary shows up at her door. Mary's response to Elizabeth blessing her goes like this. Verse 46, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He brings, she brings praise back to Jesus. The Lord saves. That's the whole basis of this child that's coming. She's been called, told to say that his name shall be God saves. So God is my Savior. The Lord saves is the bottom line of what this is all about. For he is being mindful of the humble state of his servant. Why did God pick Mary? Simply because he knew she could handle it. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. We talk about the mighty one like that. I read one commentary this week who said, you know, this sounds a lot more like a soldier's victory cry than it does a maiden's tale. That's exactly right. His mercy extends to those who fear him. Those who fear him are those who recognize that God needs to be in control. But the bottom line is, this is a God of mercy. There's a couple of words in the New Testament that get translated mercy. This one, its, it's precise definition is along the lines of, one who shows kindness and concern towards another. That's how God's acting. From generation to generation. Now listen, I'm going to read three verses in a little world, so listen carefully. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from the thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has set the rich way empty. Verses 51 and 53 are a whole bunch of words, lines, that, that fit together, and they kind of they kind of have an unusual grammatical construction. And it doesn't really, it's hard to put it into English well. But all these words indicate that God has done something, but he hasn't quite done it yet. What that means is he's already finished this, but it's still to come. In other words, this is prophetic. If there's a prophecy that God gives, it will happen. It's a guarantee. God's word God doesn't go back on his word. A prophetic word will come true, and this is prophetic. He has done these things. He has humbled the proud. Do we always see that today? Maybe not its fulfillment, but it's coming. That's a promise. Well, the proud will be humbled. The powerful need to be reminded of their need to, be to have their pride destroyed and to find their happiness in the things of Jesus. Are the powerful better off being broken? Absolutely. He has helped his servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Interesting that three months Remember the beginning, six months? Six plus three, I think, is nine. Nine months is usually about the length of a pregnancy, if memory serves. It's been a few years since we've had one of those in our house. When Elizabeth now, the baby comes, and she becomes the center of attention, Mary sneaks away. Mary sneaks away. She was a teenager with typical dreams of the future, and suddenly she is faced with the question, am I willing to accept God's plan for my life when it is so different than my own plans? And you know what? It's a good question for all of us. We have a God who wants joy to be one of the, the primary things in our lives. Humility is putting aside my expectations of life, and I'm going to tell you what leads to joy. 
I've several times over the years said that my definition of joy, as I've studied the scriptures, is it is a defiant nonetheless. And what I mean by that is no matter what the world and life and anyone throws at me, I will find my satisfaction in my Creator. I am not defined by the disappointments of life. And the more that I find my satisfaction in God, the more that I am able to handle the things that disappoint me. That's why Christmas is a time of joy. Jesus coming so that we can find personal joy in the Creator. We lit this third candle. Now, we haven't followed the traditional, some of the traditions of colors and that, mostly because I couldn't find the right color candles this year. But often we call the third candle the joy candle. It's often a different color. And it's good because as God steps into the life of people who are broken and hurting, he does a complete reversal. He brings out joy. We come to a God who brings joy. I'm going to invite us to turn to follow the books, hymn number 52, Joy is the Lord.